Falcon 9 suffers its first failure after a long streak of successful landings, Starliner finally has a return date, Europa Clipper is back on track, and three anomaly investigations are case closed. We'll cover all that and a whole lot more this week in Spaceflight. NASA's Europa Clipper mission is still on track for its launch in October. That is, of course, good news in any situation. But if you're a regular viewer, you might know that not so long ago, the spacecraft was in danger of missing its launch. But if not, let me catch you up. Just a few months ago, NASA learned that there might have been issues with the transistors used on the spacecraft. Radiation testing for another project that used the same components revealed that these transistors weren't as resistant to radiation as previously thought, and that would have been a huge problem for the mission. But why? Well, Europa Clipper is NASA's mission to study Jupiter's moon Europa, and in terms of radiation, that environment is anything but kind. Jupiter's strong magnetic field captures charged particles from the solar wind and traps them inside the planet's radiation belts. This creates an incredibly harsh radiation environment, the most intense in the solar system, and any spacecraft getting anywhere close to the planet must be able to withstand it. Now, unfortunately, radiation wreaks havoc on electronic components like transistors, which are used as electrical switches in digital systems. If these transistors succumb to the intense radiation, that could then lead to Clipper's electronic systems failing. And that would, in turn, threaten the entire mission. So when NASA figured out that the transistors used on Europa Clipper might be vulnerable at lower levels of radiation than previously believed, it quickly started testing the components. Those tests have now revealed that the transistors can, in fact, support the spacecraft's baseline mission in the radiation environment around Jupiter. In other words, Clipper should be able to handle the radiation and perform its planned mission without problems. This means that Europa Clipper is now good to proceed towards further launch preparations. The spacecraft will fly on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy, with the launch window opening on October 10th. The project's next key milestone is in a few weeks, when teams will decide whether the project is ready to proceed with launch. But with the transistor issues resolved, Clipper is now a lot closer to passing that milestone. Phew! NASA has finally set a date for Starliner's return and has decided that Sunita Williams and Butch Wilmore won't be coming home with it. The astronauts have now been on the International Space Station for more than 10 times longer than originally planned and will stay there until February when they can come home on a SpaceX Crew Dragon. Starliner Calypso was launched on June 5th with Butch and Sunny on board and experienced some thruster issues and helium leaks on the way up to the space station. While NASA and Boeing initially claimed that these were only minor issues, they ended up causing delay after delay. But this wasn't the first time Starliner experienced issues with its propulsion system, as the previous uncrewed test flight was also plagued by misbehaving thrusters. NASA and Boeing believed that they had solved the problems after that flight, but that clearly was not the case. They wanted to get to the bottom of it this time, so they decided to thoroughly test the thrusters at a test facility at White Sands, New Mexico, hoping to replicate the issue. And it worked! These tests ultimately help teams to find the cause of the thruster failures. The part of the spacecraft that contains the thrusters, also known as the doghouse, got hotter than expected. This in turn caused a Teflon seal inside of an oxidizer valve to fail. With the source of the problems now known, NASA began to doubt whether Starliner was safe enough to meet the safety margins required for a nominal return. While Boeing remains confident in Starliner's safety, NASA is still very risk-averse, which, as the agency has unfortunately learned the hard way, is very necessary. And so this week, NASA decided against the risk of a crewed return of Starliner. Instead, Calypso will return to Earth without Butch and Sunny, who will stay on the station as part of its regular crew and return on Crew Dragon Freedom in February. To accommodate this change, SpaceX's upcoming crew rotation mission, Crew 9, will now launch with only two crew members instead of the regular four, and NASA just announced them to be Nick Haig and Alexander Gorbanov. But before that, Starliner Calypso needs to leave the station, as it's currently occupying the port that Crew-9 will dock to. That departure is now scheduled for September 6th, and this week, NASA and Boeing polled GO for Starliner's uncrewed return. If all goes well, Calypso will land at White Sands six hours later. Now this was only a short summary of everything that happened with Starliner, but earlier this week we published a video going into it all in a lot more detail. You should definitely check it out. This week, Astrobotic wrapped up the investigation into the failure of its Peregrine moon lander. Peregrine was launched atop the inaugural flight of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket earlier this year. 
While the launch itself was a great success, the spacecraft unfortunately experienced an anomaly early into its mission. This led to Peregrine re-entering Earth's atmosphere instead of landing on the moon as planned. Astrobotic has now figured out what caused the anomaly, and it was our old friend, Helium. More specifically, a helium pressure control valve in the lander's propulsion system didn't do its job. The valve failed to seal correctly, after which the helium began to flow into Peregrine's oxidizer tank. This caused the tank to rapidly and uncontrollably overpressurize and burst, leaking oxidizer for the remainder of the mission. Now, interestingly, Astrobotic had already flagged this valve as a potential problem since a similar valve had leaked during spacecraft testing. Ultimately, the company decided not to replace the valve as the probability of failure was considered to be low. Replacing it would also take too much time and could have led to Peregrine missing its launch date completely. So in the end, Peregrine made its launch date but missed the moon. Astrobotic wasn't the only company to reveal the cause of an anomaly this week. We also got reports on two rocket failures that occurred earlier this year. First, Japanese company Space One revealed why its Kairos rocket failed in March. Now, you might remember that that rocket exploded shortly after it lifted off from Space One's private spaceport on its inaugural flight. The anomaly on this flight was caused by the rocket's solid fuel first stage, which burned its fuel at a slower rate than modeled. This triggered the autonomous flight termination system, leading to the unfortunate but spectacular explosion that we saw on launch day. With the cause of this anomaly known, Space One is now planning its next flight for December of this year. Hopefully it'll get a lot further from the launch pad this time. We'll keep an eye on it and we'll let you know what happens. We also learned what happened on July 19th when ABL Space Systems performed a static fire test ahead of the second flight of their RS-1 rocket. During that test, all 11 engines ignited successfully, but the rocket auto-aborted soon thereafter. The abort was caused by a faulty pressure sensor in engine 10. That should have been the end of it, if not for a fire that developed at the base of the rocket after some fuel leaked from engines 5 and 8. Now at first, the fire was contained by ABL's fire suppression system, but it ran out of water after 11 and a half minutes. The raging fire eventually caused the rocket structure to fail, after which the tanks buckled and the rocket was destroyed. Fortunately, the damages to the launch pad and ground system were limited. ABL is now refurbishing these ahead of the next attempt. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Have you ever spent a lot more on something than you originally expected? Well, that happened after NASA commissioned a new mobile launcher for its SLS rocket. It was supposed to be a $383 million project, but this week, the agency's Office of Inspector General projected that the costs might actually reach a massive $2.7 billion, and it won't even be finished in time. This new mobile launcher is an upgraded version of the launch platform used for the first Artemis mission. Compared to that one, the new tower is slightly taller and beefed up at the base to support the heavier loads of SLS Block 1B, the variant of SLS that'll launch Artemis 4 and beyond. NASA originally planned to upgrade the existing tower, but decided against it as it would delay the Artemis IV mission, which is currently scheduled for September of 2028. But now, the new report expects the tower to not be ready to support a launch until spring of 2029. Now, if the new tower features only minor upgrades compared to the existing one, why is it so hard to build a new one? Well, the report attributes the cost overruns and delays to mismanagement, underestimation of costs, and technical challenges. NASA management, however, disagrees with the report's projections, as the project is currently in its construction phase and the cost increases should be lower than they were during previous phases. Well, let's hope they're right, because this report is not looking good. NASA is getting ready for an exciting mission. No, really, they even called it EXCITE! That's short for Exoplanet Climate Infrared Telescope. But unlike most of NASA's telescopes, this one will be attached to a helium balloon. Now, this is no ordinary party balloon as it'll fly Excite above 99.5% of the atmosphere up to an altitude of 40 kilometers and stay there for over a dozen days. With Earth's atmosphere out of the way, Excite will study giant gaseous exoplanets called hot Jupiters. With these studies, scientists hope to reveal how heat and compounds like water, methane, and carbon dioxide are distributed and circulating throughout the extreme atmospheres on these planets. These studies require the telescope to observe the exoplanet for a prolonged period, which is costly to do with space telescopes like Hubble or the James Webb Space Telescope. When operational, Excite will be able to perform these studies instead. NASA is preparing to fly a test flight from New Mexico very soon. If successful, Excite's first science mission is expected to take off from Antarctica. Relativity Space has been showing off the fairing for its upcoming Terran R rocket. 
This is the company's upcoming partially reusable heavy lift launch vehicle, currently set to launch no earlier than 2026. Relativity has been working on Terran R for a few years now, but the development process took a turn after the first and only flight of the company's Terran 1 rocket in March of last year. Originally, Terran R was supposed to be fully 3D printed, just like Terran 1. But after the flight, the company announced that it would also employ more traditional techniques for Terran R, allowing the company to bring the rocket to market sooner. It seems like Relativity has taken a similar approach with the rocket's fairing, as the photo released by Relativity shows striking similarities with another photo of the fairing for ESA's Ariane 6. That fairing is made by the Swiss company Beyond Gravity, formerly known as Ruag Space, which also produces fairings for ULA's Atlas and Vulcan rockets, as well as the Japanese H3. Neither company has confirmed the collaboration, but it certainly seems to fit Relativity's plan to get Terran R to space as soon as possible. Firefly's Blue Ghost Moonlander is going on a road trip and its first stop is NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL. Firefly built the lander to demonstrate the company's lunar landing capabilities for NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. The agency provided 10 scientific payloads and technology demonstrations to fly on board, and this week, with these payloads now integrated into the lander, Firefly finally sent Blue Ghost out of its factory doors. Once at JPL, it'll undergo a series of environmental tests. If no issues arise, Blue Ghost will then continue on its journey to Cape Canaveral in Florida ahead of its launch on Falcon 9 later this year. In other Firefly news, the company also recently announced that Jason Kim will become its new CEO on October 1st. Firefly had been looking for a new CEO after Bill Weber's term at the company was abruptly ended last month. Kim previously served as CEO for Boeing subsidiary Millennium Space Systems. Now let's take a look at all the space traffic this week and see what's coming up next week in Spaceflight. This week, we started off with what at first seemed like an ordinary Starlink launch. On August 28th at 7.48 UTC, Falcon 9 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The rocket delivered eight Starlink V2 mini-satellites and 13 direct-to-cell satellites into low Earth orbit. This was the 23rd flight of booster B-1062, and it became the first booster to fly that many times. But immediately after it touched down on the deck of SpaceX's drone ship A Short Fall of Gravitas, things clearly didn't go as planned, and flames quickly engulfed the booster's engine section. This was followed by a landing leg strut snapping, and the booster tipping over and exploding. And with that, B-1062's storied career came to an abrupt end. SpaceX is still investigating the anomaly, so not much is publicly known about the cause of the issue. But if you're interested in speculation, NSF made a video with a detailed look at the anomaly and what might have caused it. In a statement provided to NSF, the FAA reported that it's requiring SpaceX to perform an investigation. But this doesn't necessarily mean that Falcon 9 can't fly until that investigation is completed. As we saw with previous anomalies, SpaceX can request a so-called public safety determination and prove that the public was never in danger. If the FAA agrees, SpaceX can then resume flights. So there is a chance that the return to flight happens sooner rather than later. Jared Isaacman, commander of the upcoming Polaris Dawn mission, claimed on social media that the cause of the failure is, quote, well understood, which suggests that the investigation may, in fact, not take that long. And hey, fun fact, Isaacman has a personal connection with this very booster, as he flew on it during the Inspiration4 mission. Regardless of the landing outcome, the booster still successfully delivered a batch of Starlink satellites into orbit. And with this launch, SpaceX has now launched a total of 6,938 satellites, of which 588 have re-entered and 5,764 have moved into their operational orbit. We also had the launch of Galactic Energy's Series 1S, the sea-launched version of the Series 1. Liftoff occurred on August 29th at 5.22 Universal Time from a sea launch platform on the Yellow Sea off the coast of China. It carried six remote sensing satellites into a sun-synchronous orbit. Wrapping up the week, Blue Origin launched its NS-26 mission. On August 29th, New Shepard lifted off from Blue Origin's launch site in Van Horn, Texas, carrying a crew of six into space on a suborbital trajectory. The passengers on this mission were Nicolina Elric, Rob Furl, Eugene Grin, Iman Jahangir, Carson Kitchen, and Ephraim Rabin, all on their first spaceflight. Furl was the first NASA-funded researcher to conduct an experiment on a suborbital space mission. He performed an experiment to study how plant genes react to the transition from and to microgravity. The results of the experiment will later be studied in a lab, alongside a control experiment that was performed on the ground at the same time by Furl's co-investigator Annalisa Paul. 
This was the 11th flight for New Shepard's booster Tail 4, which landed successfully on the landing pad afterward. Going into next week, we'll have the final flight of the European Vega rocket on September 4th. Liftoff is scheduled for 150 UTC from the ELV site in Europe's spaceport in French Guiana. The payload on this mission will be the Sentinel-2C Earth Observation Satellite. We were also supposed to have a few Falcon 9 launches next week, including the Polaris Dawn mission that was supposed to launch last week and delayed multiple times due to technical and weather-related issues. But until we get more information from SpaceX or the FAA, we just don't know much about the upcoming schedule for the Falcon launches. Whatever happens, we'll keep you posted. And that's your weekly update of Spaceflight News. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, and I'll see you all again next week to recap this week in Spaceflight.